The Talladega Super Speedway has been the prime example of NASCAR unpredictability and at the same time, insane domination. In the early 2000s, this was put on full display every time the sport set cars upon the race surface at the two and two thirds mile track. Due to the aggressive restricted plate package that NASCAR gave the Cup Series, the racing at the restricted plate tracks was more aggressive than ever before. In these races, some of the biggest runs in the draft were being formed in NASCAR history at the time. This caused drivers to have the maneuverability to move wherever they wanted and to have ultra-competitive racing all throughout the field. With the inception of it, two teams emerged as the dominant ones to beat. Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, or DEI, and Hedrick Motorsports, also known as HMS. DEI being led by the two-pronged attack of Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the number 8 car and Michael Waltrip in the number 15. From 2001 through 2003, DEI won 9 of the 12 restricted plate races. This included Dale Jr. winning four Talladega races in a row, as well as Waltrip winning the 2003 Daytona 500. Going into 2004, they also had won the last five Talladega races combined. And add to all this the fact that Jr. had the greatest speed weeks ever in 2004, the cherry on the top of it being a 2004 Daytona 500 victory. Meanwhile, HMS was really the supporting characters of this domination. On numerous occasions, while the 8 and 15 pulled ahead, it's the Hendrick 24 or 48 cars directly behind them. Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson were always good, even great, but not great enough. But the tide was shifting as the previous couple races saw their DEI foes barely cling on to a couple wins compared to the previous races. Along with this, Three of these drivers were becoming clear championship contenders in 2004. If somebody was going to win, they'd have to go through either the 8, 24, or 48. So the stage was set for a clash of drafting giants at the Super Speedway. With around 150,000 fans in the stands and over 10 million more watching on TV, Ricky Rudd and Michael Waltrip led the 43-car field down to the green. Down the back stretch, the DEI strength of Mikey's car showed as he stretched out to a three-car length lead. As would be the case for most of the day, the lead changed as Joe Nemechek took over. At the same time, Ricky Craven's number 32 went up in smoke. With some pitting and others staying out, a single file restart would help string out the field briefly. But with more lines, the Pied Piper of Dale Earnhardt Jr. decided it was time to get the lead. On only the 11th lap, the Alabama division of Junior Nation leapt out onto their feet as the 8 car held command. While not keeping the lead, each lap, fast cars like the 8 merely needed to stay in the top group. It was a roulette wheel where nobody could establish dominance. It was too crazy for them to handle. Jimmy Johnson running right behind Robbie Gordon. Oh, trouble. there it is. 17. Matt Kenseth, the 17. Nine. Casey Kane, I think it's going to oh. be, I don't think that many guys are going to get in it, y'all. Darrell, I like what Casey Kane did. He just cut left and cut away from it and slid down, and I don't believe Casey Kane made any cuts. Right yellow here. car right in the middle of the pack. Ooh, yeah. Slid up into Kevin Harvick. Yep. Incredibly, it looked as though there was little to no damage on every car involved. Once again, the caution brought everyone into the pits. Due to different adjustments and tire strategies, the field was again shuffled. By lap 30, though, the field was getting back to full song. Hendrick and DEI finally showing up to again be the ones to beat. Even with the 48 having a flat, it felt more like a speed bump rather than a day-long detriment. Of the teams up front, it was going to be the 8 and 24 being the strongest from each stable. Finally, after tons of early calamity, they got into a long run. With it, handling became a concern as the old Talladega surface chewed up tires like it was bubblegum. The field would split as the run went on, but with Ward Burton blowing up, the field was spared by five laps from performing green flag pit stops. With the field bunched up and more aggressive, it was only a matter of time before disaster would strike. 2001, we've not had a serious injury in the big one. What triggers Let's this? Let's see what happened over here. Yikes. 
Looked like it, uh, the 20 car made some contact with the 97 getting in the three over there. And boy, you can see the results. And Darrell, that happened down low. A lot of those cars were going high, but Kurt Busch went up the racetrack right there. That got about six or eight of them. In 2004, Tony Stewart would have one of the most controversial seasons of his NASCAR career. This race would be part of a compounding piece to this. In total, 10 cars were caught up in the accident due to his mistake, and none of them were very happy with the 2002 champion. After a debris yellow at the halfway mark, it was beginning to ramp up. With 75 to go, the eldest Earnhardt in the field, that of Kerry Earnhardt, spun into the inside wall after incidental contact with Michael Waltrip after his 15 car was clipped by Jeff Gordon. Much like every caution, the field pitted, and this was needed as a long run would be put into full effect for everyone. Amazingly, for the next 50 laps, the only cautions to come would be from debris. But with most of these laps being run under green, it meant that laps would click off much faster and the end of the race was fastly approaching. With 43 to go, Joe Nemechek blew up and Sterling Marlin's 40 Dodge lost a tire, being one of the debris cautions. With the yellow, rookie Brian Vickers would get lucky and be the lucky dog and would be brought back into contention. With 38 laps to go, everyone peeled off to make some of their final pit stops. And with 35 to go, the field restarted. With a shuffled field, as many that had made those previous pit stops topped off right before they went back to green to get just enough fuel to make it to the end. At the 30 to go mark, it would actually be Jimmy Johnson leading, but he wasn't doing so without pressure. Both of the dynamic DEI duo of Junior and Mikey were second and third behind him, putting on tons and tons of pressure. Well, until 28 to go, when they jumped out to first and second after NASCAR warned the 8 not to bump the 48 as much. His solution? Pass him. The end of the race was a present and prime focus now, and the best cars in the field were once again the ones to beat in every single way, with track position, speed, and talent. With 23 laps left, the Talladega caution record would be tied at 9 as debris once again would be on the track. Green flag conditions would resume with 17 laps left. Junior up front, but Mikey stranded with little help to start. With 14 laps left, the biggest challenger to the 8 was surging as Jeff Gordon had entered the fray. Three wide was everywhere. Naturally, the caution would soon return as Tony Stewart spun off the nose of Jimmy Johnson's blue and silver 48 Monte Carlo. This meant that when the field returned to green, there'd only be a mere nine laps left. The field spread out with Kevin Harvick's 29 actually taking a power move on Dale Jr. and taking the lead. In doing this, Jr. was put together with Michael Waltrip. But the thing was, his one weakness had been exposed. The eight had had slow restarts all day, and in this case, it bit him dearly. With seven left, Harvick led over Casey Mears, Mark Martin, and then side by side was the DEI duo and the Hendrick duo. But with six to go, the eight and 15 made their move, and the eight was back in the lead, but this time alone. He left Waltrip out to dry, and this opened the door for Gordon and Johnson to work together and team up on the eight car. Tenth spot. Yeah, well, he and Dale Jr. are up on the outside together. I mean, we got 140,000 people here with five and a half laps to go. Nobody's sitting down. Whoa, Gordon, way to the bottom of the racetrack, and Jimmy Johnson comes right up the bumper of Dale Earnhardt Jr., and Gordon gets the lead. But can he keep it? No, he can't. And they car is just so strong, they can make a run on him, and obviously they can get to, oh, boy. That was almost a disaster. Yes, that looked it like was. a Tony Stewart deal there. Five laps to go this time. But with this, the 24 and 8 were now separated from their help both. They were dueling man on man. With five to go, the classic drafting battle of Gordon versus Earnhardt at Talladega was afoot. Gordon inches ahead. Right there is where Junior is so strong. Sailing off into oh, the trouble. turn. One car around, and it's Brian Vickers. All right, the caution is out, and we are past the red flag lap. We are past the red flag lap. But remember, the field was frozen when the caution flag came out. As the aforementioned Vickers spun, the Budweiser Chevy was in the process of passing the Pepsi Chevy. Coming to the yellow with four laps to go, the Bud car came across first. 
The Talladega crowd went absolutely berserk. But as they came around again to three to go, it would be Jeff Gordon's blue Pepsi Chevy in front of the Red 8. With three laps to go, the question now was whether or not they would go back to green as NASCAR had deemed that Jeff Gordon was the leader. At the maximum, there'd be a one-lap green-white checker finish, as at this time, NASCAR only raced to the scheduled distance of each race, so finishes under yellow were actually semi-common. And for the 2004 Aaron's 499, it became increasingly clear that this would happen again. The signal slowly trickled through the crowd, as on TV, replays showed Gordon ahead of Earnhardt at the moment of caution. It was becoming clear that Gordon was the winner. Junior was runner-up. The cars idled around at 70 miles per hour under caution and went under the yellow and white flag. The crowd at this point had become absolutely disgusted. Only a year and a half ago, in 2002 at the Pepsi 400 at Daytona, the race had a similar yellow flag finish. This saw the crowd throw everything in sight, whether it be beer, coolers, or chairs, onto the racetrack. And on this cloudy April 2004 day in Alabama, the NASCAR world would see part two of this story. Free all over the place out there, just watch it. That final stop. And there is, that's what NASCAR was concerned about. A lot of debris oh on the racetrack. Oh my God. Play all Budweiser can. However, that debris has come from that section of the grandstand. That's a sad commentary. The fans, of course, they want to see a green flag finish. Safety of the drivers, though, is paramount. And Jeff Gordon will win the Aaron's 499 over Dale Earnhardt Jr., Jimmy Johnson, Kevin Harvick. Spike, and how big to beat the DEI guys. Woo, man, thank God somebody did. Uh, I don't want to do it that controversial. I tell you, uh, the Pepsi boys put it on the uh, beer boys today. But um, we're out on that racetrack, uh, too. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if they were Pepsi cans or beer cans, but uh, there was a lot of aluminum out there on the track, that's for sure. So I did a burnout over all those cans, and man, I tell you what, it just feels great to get back to Victory Lane and, and to celebrate these guys right here. While this finish was controversial, it was supported by everyone who was implicated, winners and losers alike. While Junior questioned it in his post-race interview, he supported it upon further review later in the week. This race was huge for the implications of the next few years, as it was instrumental in the implementation of the overtime green-white checker rule later in the 2004 season. A rule that, while it has been tweaked from time to time, has led to countless great finishes over the years and the last two decades since this race. It also was the beginning of the end for DEI's plate dominance, as even though Dale Jr. won the 2004 fall Talladega race, it would be the last plate race that was ever won in a DEI car. This ushered in an era of Hendrick plate dominance, as, well, Jeff Gordon won the 2004 Pepsi 400 over Dale Jr. later that year, and then won the 2005 Daytona 500 and 2005 Aaron's 499, as well as sweeping the 2007 Talladega races. Along with this, Jimmy Johnson won the 2006 Daytona 500 and the 2006 Aaron's 499, while Brian Vickers nabbed the controversial Talladega Fall race that same year. But the longest lasting image of this race has to be 150,000 fans booing Jeff Gordon with beer cans being pelted upon his car, a peak of over 13 million more watching this from home. Honestly, it was one of the defining moments of the early 2000s for NASCAR. But now, nearly 20 years later, I want to pass it to you. What do you think of this controversial finish? Do you agree or disagree with NASCAR's call? And the big question is, who do you think wins this race if it goes green? Do you think it's Junior or Gordon? While you're at it, leave a like on this video, share this video, and subscribe to my channel for more great NASCAR content like this. And to all my channel members, thank you all so much for your support. So until next time, have a good one.